Hey, welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I want to talk about one of my favorite bands from the 80s, Tears for Fears. Full disclosure, my favorite Tears for Fears is early Tears for Fears, but we're going to cover everything. Deep dive, patent pending. So let's get to it. So the two principals of Tears for Fears are Roland Orzabal. I know I'm saying that wrong. Orzabal. Orzabal? Orzabal. Roland is the principal songwriter, and he plays guitar, keyboards, and anything else he wants to play. Kurt Smith plays bass and keyboards, and occasional lead vocals. Prior to forming Tears for Fears, the two were in a band with a group of friends, and they were known as Graduate. They were known as Graduate because they'd opened their shows with a cover of Mrs. Robinson from the movie The Graduate. Graduate put out an album in 1978, and their big hit was called Elvis Should Play Ska. It's a fun yet meaningless song whose sound mixes Elvis Costello with madness, and the song is propelled by Roland's excellent guitar work, and it sounds pretty cool. I'm going to put a link below in the description to Elvis Should Play Ska, because you have to hear this song and see them live on TV doing it to truly experience just how far they would come. Roland and Kurt got tired of touring and wanted to do their own thing and make a different kind of music. So they quit the band in 1980, and Roland set about writing songs in a new direction. Unlike most British bands that broke through in the early 80s, Tears for Fears were not from Manchester or Liverpool or any other city with a thriving music scene. They were from Bath which had new music scene. If Tears for Fears had never broken through, Graduate would have been the most famous group from Bath. So it really forced them to do their own thing. At the same time, most synth bands were dressing up, wearing makeup, and dancing like extroverts. Tears for Fears were making music that was more insular and exploring an interior world. Normally bands are influenced by music groups that come before them. Tears for Fears was influenced by a psychologist. This man's name was Arthur Janov. Arthur Janov is the man behind primal scream therapy. His most famous clients were probably John Lennon and Yoko Ono. So this guy had a moment. And Arthur Janov's book, Prisoners of Pain, inspired the name Tears for Fears. It speaks to the concept that if children were able to express their pain during their childhood, they wouldn't grow up with trouble from repressed pain later in life. The book talks about tears as a replacement for fears, aka Tears for Fears. Roland and Kurt shopped around the two songs that they had already, Suffer the Children and Pale Shelter, and they ended up signing to Phonogram Records. And in March of 1983, The Hurting was released. This was one of the most important albums to me in my childhood. I was a very angry young child. I turned into a kind of angry adult. But this helped a bit. It took a little of the edge off. This entire first album, The Hurting, deals with childhood trauma as its central theme. The original British release came out through Vertigo, on Phonogram. The American release uses a different cover. It is my favorite photograph of early Tears for Fears. People may not realize this early Tears for Fears. It's a very melancholy sound that they have. I will put their sound and their lyrics up against any goth band you throw at me. A few albums influenced The Hurting. One was David Bowie's Scary Monsters. One was Talking Heads' Remain in Light. Their main influence was Gary Newman, whose albums proved to the young duo that you don't need a full band to create a quality album. Perhaps the largest influence on this album was Peter Gabriel's third album, sometimes referred to as Melt. I'm going to put a link below in the descriptions to the song No Self-Control. Listen to where I have it queued up, and you'll hear synth work that is very reminiscent of what you hear on the debut album song Change. People think that Tears for Fears was a little band who broke through on their second album. This was a number one album in the UK. It took them a little while to get going singles-wise, but this album was a big success out of the gate. The album kicks off with the title track, The Hurting. The Hurting is my third favorite song on this whole album. The opening lyric, Is It An Horrific Dream, sets the somber, wounded tone for the entire rest of the LP. By the way, I always thought in the song, Roland was just yodeling. Duh, ha, ha. He's actually singing the hurt, hurt, hurt. Never too old to learn something. The song's final lines, learn to cry like a baby, then the hurt won't come back, is ripped right from the pages of the Arthur Janoff playbook. It's very much espousing the tenets of primal scream therapy. The next song on the album is Mad World, which was released as a single 
and it made it to number three on the UK charts, it would be their first of 17 top 40 hits between 1982 and 2005. That's a ridiculous run. I don't care who you are. Mad World is a brilliant song. As you can see on the 12 inch, they use my favorite picture of the band. Mad World is a breathtakingly uplifting, depressing song. I don't need to explain to you just how great Mad World is. You already know it, I'm sure. I'm going to put a link below to the band performing Mad World, and it's an excellent version. However, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I'm aware some of you had your introduction to the song from the Gary Jules cover, which was used in the soundtrack to the movie Donnie Darko. Gary Jules' cover proves that being true to the lyric is not always a good thing. Apologies to those of you who love that version, but I despise that version almost as much as I love the original song. One of the things that makes the original great is changing up the sad lyrics with catchy music. The Gary Jules cover version is unapologetically and unironically depressing. It's the equivalent of Songs by the Smiths if you took away Johnny Marr. Heaven knows I'm miserable. Now? Just doesn't work. Next we have Pale Shelter, represented here. This 12 inch, by the way, has the B-side, We Are Broken, which you would later hear reworked for the second album. It's a great version and it's really interesting to hear the evolution of that song. As I said earlier, Pale Shelter was one of two songs that landed the band their record contract. The other was Suffer the Children. Pale Shelter is a beautifully constructed song with its verses being driven along by a recurring guitar strum and its chorus enriched with gorgeously layered vocals. I believe the track is a sort of reproach to parents who may give their kids everything they need except for that one thing they truly need, which is love. Fred Rogers taught us that. The electro hand claps at the end kick the song into overdrive and is another nice touch on this finely crafted song. Incidentally, you or your kids might have heard Pale Shelter sampled for the song Secrets by The Weeknd. The next song, Ideas as Opiates, is a spacious soundstage that owes a real percussive debt to the track Biko on Peter Gabriel's third album. This is one of the more experimental tracks on the album, and once you get into it, you're going to love it. Just let it do its thing. Memories Fade is another harrowing track that covers tougher ground than most goth bands fear to tread. The lyrics state, memories fade, but the scars still linger. Roland is again speaking of psychological repression, where these horrid memories that you shove to the back of your mind still maintain a terrible grasp on you, whether you realize it or not. Repression takes so much energy. Use that energy in better ways, like tracking down vinyl. Suffer the Children was the very first song that Kurt and Roland worked on together after leaving Graduate. Like so many tracks on this album, this is a sad song that sounds happy. It seems to concern a scenario where both child and parent are each disappointed with their lonely life, even while the two are chained together. The outro, where the children's chorus comes in, sounds almost carefree and demonic at the same time. Roland originally wrote the song Change for his girlfriend to sing. BT Dub, she later became his wife for over 30 years. This is a good guy right here. Kurt was the one who was like, that's a great song. We're going to use that. As with all the songs that call for a softer delivery on this album, Kurt sings this one and he does a great job. The song itself doesn't really mean much. It's just a simple pop lyric about how everyone can change. That can be either positive or negative. But within the song itself are great little couplets that are super pithy and provide enough substance to sustain the emotion of the song. One of my favorites is, and something on your mind became a point of view. I lost your honesty, you lost the life in you. Preach, Roland. As I said, this album was a hit, and because it was a hit, the record company wanted new product from the boys, but they didn't have their new album yet. So in November of 1983, the band put out The Way You Are. This single that was dropped between the first and second album so that the fans would have some product in the shop, backed with the instrumental B-side, The Marauders, is one of the band's most interesting early songs. I have always loved this song and have strong nostalgic memories attached to it. The boys trade vocals throughout the song and there's some really great synth work on this. What's really unique about The Way You Are is that both Roland and Kurt hate it. What happened was the boys fell in love with all the new studio equipment that they were learning to use for the first time, and they began creating cool sounds with their new bandmates. Then, rather than writing the songs first, like they did on their debut album, they tried creating songs out of these new cool sounds. This track came out of that process. 
and it's one of those rare tracks written by the entire band. But Roland and Kurt soon found the song, and doing standalone singles in general, unsatisfying. I still think it's a great track, and it sounds like what it is, a transformation. This sounds like a perfect hybrid between the debut album and the album that was going to come after it. In February of 1985, the band released Songs from the Big Chair. This record has a much bigger sound, with epic production. These songs are more organic, with a full band playing on it. Ian Stanley, who had become Roland's collaborator, is in the band on keyboards, and he co-wrote some of the greatest songs on here. The keyboards on this album now exist to provide color and texture, whereas on the debut album, they were doing most of the heavy lifting. On this album, Tears for Fears puts us right back on the analyst couch, and we loved it. The album went to number one in the US and to number two in the UK, where it was kept off the number one slot by the Phil Collins juggernaut, No Jacket Required. How popular was Songs from the Big Chair? Between tours, rest, and studio work, the band's next album didn't come out until almost five years later. Lead off track Shout has a cathartic message, and I defy you to not fall in love with it because it's kind of a perfect song. I don't think people today, especially kids, could understand what a massive hit that was. You would listen to it so much that you would get sick of it and you would turn off the radio, at which point the video would come on the TV. It was everywhere and it was inescapable. So it got played out very quickly and I soon grew to hate the song. But now so much time has passed, I can once again appreciate the greatness of the song. And Roland is becoming a fantastic vocalist right before our eyes. He sings most of the songs on here. The Working Hour is a beautiful song and perhaps the most underrated song on this album. It blends elements of synth rock, alternative, and yacht rock to create an indefinable ballad that houses, perhaps, Roland's best vocal on this album. This song might be about the working hour spent in the analyst couch, or it might be about how the band is under pressure to create a new album of hits, and how the fear of failure wraps Roland up in chains. I assume at this point people are born knowing the next track, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. This is one of only two songs on this album where Kurt sings lead, and he does not disappoint. The bridge, the part that goes, there's a room where the light won't find you, holding hands while the world comes tumbling down, is my favorite part of the whole damn song. And it sort of takes the place of a chorus, because the real chorus, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, is just sort of tacked on to the end of every verse. I believe the song speaks to Cold War paranoia, and how everyone should live for today and grab happiness while you can. It was, of course, a worldwide hit for the band, and it was later used as the theme song to the Dennis Miller Show. Don't hold that against them. If you'd like to hear a really great cover of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, I'm going to put it below. It's by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists. It's a really great updating, bringing out all the best elements of the song. The track Mother's Talk is next, represented here on the 12-inch. Mother's Talk was the first single released for the album. It was released before the album, and it kind of set the tone, and it told everyone that there's a much harder-edged Tears for Fears coming. Let me tell you something. Don't be fooled by how pale these pretty English boys are. Mother's Talk is funky as fuck. Riding some of Kurt's most inventive bass runs, the song's hectic pace only increases in intensity as the song goes on. It's even got some cool Art of Noise type samples that happen at the bridge and really more than anything else, speak to the time at which this album came out. I believe it's a somber, slow track that is dedicated to Robert Wyatt, the vocalist and drummer from The Soft Machine, who had a very high, sweet, and fragile voice that's very similar to the voice in which Roland sings this song. The lyrics are either pessimistic or optimistic, depending on how you interpret the song. In the end, we're not sure whether the song's subject believes or doesn't believe. And it's that ambiguity, I believe, that gives the song its evergreen appeal. Incidentally, the B-side for the single of I Believe was a version of Robert Wyatt's Sea Song. So it's a Robert Wyatt double dip. The song Broken is a real badass track with some of the best guitar work on the album. It makes a really nice bookend for the tracks before and after it. Speaking of which, Broken puts a definitive negative slant on the song before it, I Believe. The lyrics state, I stop believing everything is gonna be all right. Broken, we are broken. Musically, the song is a real cross between Mother's Talk and the track it's leading into, Head Over Heels. And that makes it the perfect lead-in slash prelude to Head Over Heels. Broken ends with the iconic line, In my mind's eye, one little boy anger one little man. Funny how time flies. Which you will hear again in Head Over Heels. Speaking of which, here's the 12-inch version. Head Over Heels is the only track on the album co-written 
by Kurt and Roland, and it's one of the band's all-time best songs. The song is bookended on the album and on its single with two different versions of Broken, the latter one a live version. Head Over Heels is as close as the band comes thus far to a straight-up love song. That said, it's got just enough cryptic lyrics that speak to family pressures and the stresses of a violent life that the chorus, which finds the character Head Over Heels, comes as sweet relief. I'm going to put a link below to the band performing the song on Dick Clark's Rockin' Eve because it does not get any more 80s than that. You're welcome. Incidentally, the B-side of Head Over Heels is a haunting little synth song called When In Love With A Blind Man. And it opens with the amazing lyric, When in love with a blind man, you watch what you say. On the album Closer, Listen, the band gets jazzy. It's a piano-based slow jam, and it's the second of two songs sung by Kurt, along with Head Over Heels. It's an odd, moody track that only finds itself warmed up by Kurt's soft vocals. The lyrics are pretty cryptic, with Mother Russia badly burned while its children lick its wounds. To make matters murkier, the song's chorus slash outro is sung in Spanish, where the words birthday girl, no need to worry, are repeated over and over and over. It's a pretty bizarre way to end an album, but somehow it works. How popular was Songs from the Big Chair? Between touring, rest, and studio work, the band's next album didn't come out for almost five years. In September of 1989, the band released The Seeds of Love. This album was very successful and made it to number eight in the US. The album, in my opinion, is dense, and overproduced, but spending millions of dollars on studio time will do that. Full disclosure, my Tears for Fears ended with songs from the big chair, but I didn't know it at the time. I kept waiting for them to come back, and I waited, and I waited. When they finally came back, almost five years later, and I heard the music they put out, I felt like someone took a Tears for Fears label and stuck it on a level 42 record. That's unfair, but it speaks to my feeling at the time. Basically what I'm saying is, this album does not rock, but taken on its own terms, it has a lot to offer. Woman in Chains is the perfect leadoff track for this album. It introduces the fact that the band has evolved, given Roland's new soulful delivery, a dense yet lush production sound, and the addition of a female co-vocalist in Oletta Adams. Incidentally, this is a nice little story, Kurt and Roland discovered Oletta Adams when she was playing in a hotel bar in Missouri. They were on tour and they were burnt out and they were watching this performer putting on a great show and loving performing. And the band were really impressed with her, both talent-wise, but also they missed having that much fun. She was the one who reawakened that spark in them through her performance and reminded them of how much fun they should be having. They didn't even meet her that night, but two years later, they flew to see her and asked her to join the band, both in the studio and out on the road, as singer and keyboard player. But they weren't doing her a favor. In a sense, Roland built the next phase of Tears for Fears entirely around Oleta Adams, and she shines on this entire album. And at times, like with the following song, Bad Man's Song, songs almost seem to be taken from an Oleta Adams solo album, but I digress. Woman in Chains has been called a feminist anthem, but I think that's nothing new because Roland's been writing humanistic songs from a female perspective since the debut album. The title track, Sowing the Seeds of Love, is very much a Beatlesque romp with elements that are evocative of the sound off of Magical Mystery Tour. It's the unqualified chart success off this album with a retro sound not unlike Let Love Rule by Lenny Kravitz, which was also released in September of 1989. There must have been something in the water that month. Brown Acid? My favorite part of the song is the bridge. I love a good bridge. Where's that confounded bridge? The lyrics state, time to open your eyes, eat all your words, swallow your pride. Best part of the song. Advice for the Young at Heart is the only song on this whole album where Kurt does lead vocals. And it's a pitch-perfect performance. Kurt always excelled on songs that call for pretty yet poignant vocals. I believe this song is a warning to older couples to keep the flame of their love alive. It's got the lyrics, working hour is over, we can do anything that we want. In my mind, it's motivating retirees to get their freak on before they become so old that it's dangerous. Don't want to break a hip? As with most Tears for Fears albums, Side 2 is where the more experimental, or at least traditional, songs reside. 
Standing on the Corner of the Third World is a pretty atmospheric song that seems to go nowhere for the first four minutes before kicking in the gear. I only wish the entire song had the grit and the bluesy gravitas of the final minute. Swords and Knives is one of the most interestingly constructed songs on the album, and is probably my deep cut off this LP. It's one of five songs on this album co-written by Nikki Holland. She replaced Ian Stanley as Roland's main collaborator on this album. Ian Stanley was as much of a perfectionist as Roland was, and apparently the two had a real falling out. Nikki had been Tears for Fears pianist on the Big Chair tour, and she, along with Oleta Adams, seem to have unlocked an adventurousness in Roland's songwriting. Songs are allowed to start one way and end a completely different way. It opens with sugary vocals and smooth percussion and slowly builds in intensity through backwards tracking and screaming guitars until it explodes and then returns back to its softer beginnings. It's an impressive track. The Year of the Knife is my pick for Tears for Fear song most likely to succeed on an R&B station. It's got a little sugar in its game. It's a guitar-based, hard-driving track that still somehow retains that easy-listening sheen that you'll either love or hate about this album. It's got a sing-along friendly chorus that is just built for live performances. Famous Last Words is the last track on the album, and it was the last single released from the album, and it was released without the band approval. The record company just sent it out, trying to get a little more money. It did not do well. Famous Last Words is a deathly slow ballad, a brilliant song, but by any rationale. It's an odd choice for a single, especially when you've got a song like The Year of the Knife just sitting in the chamber. In any case, it closes the album on a quiet note. At the end of this album, Kurt Smith left the band. It was easy to see why. He had less and less to do. Roland had taken over most of the lead vocals. What he wasn't singing, Oleta was now singing. Roland was a studio rat who'd spend months and months in the studio, so most of the songs were crafted without Kurt's input. Kurt left at the end of the tour for this album, but he told Roland he was leaving at the beginning of the tour, which made for a very tense, awkward tour. By the end of the tour, they were not speaking, and they would not speak for another nine years. As far as I'm concerned, this album is where Tears for Fears ends. That is not, however, how Roland felt. He soldiered on using the Tears for Fears moniker, and he put out Tears for Fears albums that I feel are solo albums in everything but name. In June of 1993, Roland released Elemental. This album was a big hit. It made it to number five in the UK. If I'm being honest, I think this is the album the band should have released in 89 instead of sowing the seeds. They would have been ahead of the guitar curve rather than chasing the trend in 93. The heavy guitar sound can't seem to be a couple of years too late in the year of Nirvana's In Utero. This might even be a better album than sowing the seeds, but it got much less exposure. It's a great guitar album. It was mastered by Bob Ludwig, so it sounds fantastic. Alan Griffiths, who played guitar on the 85 Tears for Fears tour, replaced Nicky Holland as Roland's chief collaborator. And the results are a far more stripped down album than Seeds. There are no outside session musicians, with Roland and Alan playing all the instruments. So there's a real cohesive sound to this album. Unlike Sowing the Seeds, which took place over many years in many different studios with many different producers. The lead track, Elemental, is a tribute to mind power, with the words, these days it's all in the mind, it's elemental. The song Cold was written about a photographer who was trying to take pictures of Roland and he kept turning his face during the concert, and she wrote him a note that said, how can someone who writes such beautiful songs be so cold? And he wrote a song around it. Genius. This song features some of his most inventive lyrics, and that's saying something with a brilliant songwriter like Roland. One of my favorite lines, Twists, the do run runs, I met her on a Monday and my heart stood still, into I met her on a Monday and my heart did nothing new. Isn't that great? Isn't that genius? The song continues, seems she thought of me as some mystic, fatalistic, mystical guru. Me, I haven't a clue. Roland himself sees it as a sort of conceptual sister song to Woman in Chains. Cold is my deep cut off this album. It's a Hollis heat seeker. I'm gonna make that happen. Break It Down Again is a slam against advertising and a celebration of the cycle of life. It sees the beauty in things ending, since everything can be recycled, including you. It includes the line, they make no mention of the beauty of decay, which I think sums up the song perfectly. In October of 1995, Roland released Raul and the Kings of Spain. The cover has the running of the bulls in Pamplona. Roland's dad was from Spain. 
and Roland's birth name was actually Raoul. Roland would later name his own child Raoul. The title track is somewhat of a return to form for Roland, with great guitar-based rhythms and textures. The major problem with this song, and it's true of a lot of songs on this album, is that they just don't stay with you. They don't hook themselves into your brain like the older material did, and the parts of songs seem somewhat interchangeable after a while. There's not much to hold on to, and you don't feel compelled to sing along as you did on past albums. Falling Down, on the other hand, is one of my favorite songs on the album. It's super sweet and features gorgeous melodies. Secrets is another very pretty song. Humdrum and Humble's thick production and playful lyrics make it sound like something that should have been on the Sowing the Seeds album. Sorry and Don't Drink the Water are both as heavy as any tracks Tears for Fears ever did on songs from the big chair. On the song Me and My Big Ideas, Oleda Adams returns for a duet with Roland and it's nice to hear her back again. Here she's allowed to use her full, deep, rich voice, whereas she had to sing in her upper register chest voice on Elemental. Here we get full throttle Oleta, and it's, it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful song. Released in September of 2004 in the US and March of 2005 in Britain, the final Tears for Fears album, Everybody Loves a Happy Ending. This album saw the return of Kurt Smith. Proving miracles happened, the boys made up, they found out they were entirely different people and they liked being together again, and so they put this album out. But in my opinion, Everybody Loves a Happy Ending is simply not a consistent or a cohesive album. And it almost reads like a mixture of songs from the two albums before it. Talented as Roland and Kurt are though, there are a few highlights. I like Size of Sorrow, which actually dates back to the Elemental days when the band were playing it on tour. And it's a very pretty song sung by Kurt. And it's great to hear his voice again after so many years. Closest Thing to Heaven is a beautifully crafted track that has a vocal style that's almost reminiscent of the Shy Lights. Really pretty. The track Killing with Kindness has production that would make Pink Floyd envious. Who Killed Tangerine is a great song and my favorite track on this whole album. It does seem like a conscious return to the Seeds of Love album sound but it works, and it's another Hollis heat seeker. This album might be the last one we get from them, ever, but if they've proven anything over the years, it's that you can't count them out. That's it for this week on Pop Culture Graveyard. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive on Tears for Fears. If you did, please hit the subscribe button, and I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.